sometime in March, about two weeks after the world turned upside down, I had a teary late night conversation with Valerie Kaur, a dear friend, a sick American civil rights activist and author. I need your Jewish wisdom, she said. I need to know how to navigate these times and Jewish people know what to do when one world dies and another one is born. I have to admit that deep ancient wisdom was the furthest thing from my mind. Like many of you, I was busy in March rationing toilet paper, furiously mopping the floors between Zooms, trying to keep my kids healthy and sane now that all of our worlds had shrunk to these little boxes, working to triage the illness, unemployment, isolation and anxiety in our community and learning how to grieve through a screen, all while dealing with my own sometimes irrepressible sadness and fear, not to mention my perennially crappy internet. But I took Valerie's challenge to heart. I started to read stories of Shoah survivors, people who lost everything and went on to build families and futures, perhaps the greatest testament to the triumph of the human spirit. I thought about the cantor who told me a few years ago that he performed three weddings every day in a crowded displaced persons camp after the liberation of Auschwitz. And the extraordinary story of Yossi Kleine Levy's father who escaped his small town when the Nazis came by burying himself in a hole in the ground in the forest where he crouched underground for nine months, emerging only to forage for food at night until his town was finally liberated by the Russian forces. And I dug deeper into our past. I dove into stories of blood libels, pogroms, and exiles, trying to understand how our people, through times far more challenging than these, found the strength again and again to lay old worlds to rest and build new ones in their place. That's how I came to spend the last many months with the rabbis who escaped Jerusalem just before the temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago, who set out to rebuild the Judaism that we are all inheritors of today. First, some context. Three years into the Roman siege of Jerusalem, surrounded by hunger and increasing desperation, one of the leaders of the community, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, determined that he had to escape the city. So his students placed him in a coffin as if he were dead, and they marched him through the city gates as though they were transporting his body to burial. The rabbi and his students emerged from the grips of death, and they were granted permission to build a small community in Yavne, not far from Jerusalem, close enough to smell the fires when Jerusalem was taken by Vespasian Caesar and his merciless Roman forces. Their legions breached the city walls and burned to the ground the Beit HaMikdash, our holiest of holy sites, the center of Jewish religious and spiritual practice. It was a fire so fierce, Josephus describes the whole city shaking with the sounds of Jerusalem stone exploding. The Romans wanted both to humiliate and to annihilate. They catapulted the head of a pig toward the temple altar. And elders, children, men, and women all fell at the sword's edge. Those who weren't murdered died from starvation or were brought in chains to Rome to be debased, degraded, humiliated for sport. A korban, we called it, a complete devastation. What did the rabbis, the survivors do in the face of all of that destruction? They tore their clothes, they cried, they screamed, and they lamented. They mourned for the desolation and for the desecration, for the children who died and for those children who would not be born. They wept and they trembled, they cried out names of those they lost, those they could not save. They committed to memory everything from the most sacred stories to the most mundane details. And they taught us that a healthy society must grieve. So what about us? Have we grieved in this time of incalculable loss? In small and private ways, yes. But as a society, we ache for a collective lament, for public, national, stop everything, communal mourning. That looks like Dia de los Muertos, Yom Hazikaron, death whales, nightly candlelight vigils, the AIDS memorial quilt. It looks like flags at half-mast and TV programming suspended until we lift up the names and stories of every last person killed, whether by war or famine, by Roman legions, by wildfires, by overzealous law enforcement, or by a criminally mismanaged virus. Public grief is an act of rebellion against the world as it is. It means not letting people disappear from this world. 
I read last week a post about a recent high school graduate, Ellie Savenner, who died from COVID at 19 years old. Ellie played baseball and he cared about the world. And I wonder who he would have been had he lived. And what about Otilia Levy? Her family fled pogroms in Romania only to resettle in France where they'd later be pursued by the Nazis. As the war intensified, SS soldiers found Otilia trying to hide other Jews and shot her, but she miraculously survived. This spring she fell to COVID. I want my children to know her name. Dr. Alice Gulati was a professor at Howard University who taught generations of black physicians. At the peak of the AIDS crisis, when many were afraid to even talk about AIDS, Dr. Gulati was known to cradle dying AIDS patients in her arms, kissing them on their heads, comforting them in their dying moments with love. Dr. Gulati died from COVID in May. Collective grief means lifting up their stories. It means saying their names. It means saying Brianna Taylor's name and Daniel Prude and Ahmad Arbery and Aja Raquel Roden Spears, who died in this time at 26 and 41 and 25 and 33 years old, not from COVID-19, but from a much older and even more insidious virus, the virus of racism in America. My friend, Reverend Najuma Smith Pollard says that we need to pray for all the mothers who've lost their children. We need to ask for a healing of the womb because the womb is crying. The womb is hemorrhaging. The womb is hurting. When their world was taken from them, our ancestors lamented. They didn't normalize tra tra tragedy. They did not accustom themselves to the loss of human life. They never bought the narrative that human beings were expendable, that human life could be compromised in some inhuman calculation wrought by political expediency. They never said it is what it is. They felt the weight of that tragedy, not for one day, not for a few days, but for generations still today, 2,000 years later, we mark sacred time around those losses. We sit on the floor and we fast and we read lamentations. We tell stories of the women who were ravaged and the men enslaved and children taken captive. Al Ela ni bochia, eni, eni, your deb mayim, we say. For all of these things, I weep. My eyes, my eyes are flowing with tears. We shatter glass beneath the chuppah at every wedding. A reminder that even in our most joyous moments, we have to hold the weight of that loss. Its memory is never far from us. Why have we failed to grieve all the loss from the compounding crises of our day? It's not that we haven't had the time. There were long months with no NBA, no outdoor concerts, no Shakespeare in the park. We had the opportunity. We failed to muster the collective will. Instead, a reckless, dishonest, self-interested political leadership, completely devoid of empathy, dictated a national response that left us play acting that we're okay when we are not at all okay. But willful amnesia is not a reflection of a resilient society. It's the sign of a weak society, a society in denial. Public mourning is both a sacred practice and a social necessity, a moral imperative, especially after catastrophic loss, because it forces us to reckon and to wrestle with the circumstances that gave rise to the unspeakable in the first place. We may want to skip steps, focus on silver linings, but the heart needs to weep and scream and rail against the injustice of it all. I know mine does, we need to mourn because every human life is precious. Every one of us is created in God's own image, deserving of dignity in life and in death. And grief is one of the most powerful expressions of love. It's a cry from the depths of our being that what is, is not what ought to be. Instead, we live in a country where people claiming to be proudly pro-life work feverishly to protect the life of a fetus while blithely condemning 200,000 people, mostly elderly and black and brown and poor, to die for the health of the economy. Let nature take its course, they say. I take no responsibility. The wisdom of our ancestors calls to us, there is no shortcutting this process. A society that does not honor its dead will fail to honor its living. Our rabbis took off their tefillin and they wept and they thrashed about and we too must cry and scream and tear our clothes. 
And of course, it's not only the dead that we need to grieve. There's trauma all around us, a collective, searing sense of loss. I wonder if you've yet had that moment when a video or a photo from last year pops up on your social media and you find yourself choking back tears as you gaze at images from another dimension. Simple things. Friends unmasked with arms around each other, students chatting as they walk through the hallway, people davening together in a high school gym. We need to grieve. We need to grieve for the months of terror and sadness and confusion, months in which we have sat confined in our small spaces, noticing every scratch of the throat, every wave of heat through the body, wondering if we've lost our ability to taste the food or if the food is just not spiced properly. Months of worrying for our loved ones and for ourselves while forced into a completely unnatural apartness, working alone, eating alone, sleeping alone, or a completely unnatural togetherness, teenagers with no escape from their homes, parents, especially parents of little ones who haven't had a moment of quiet, partners who liked each other more, let's just be honest, when they had a break from each other for a few hours a day. We need to grieve. We need to grieve for the months of watching as a latent anxiety, depression, or OCD became the dominant feature of our lives or the lives of our loved ones for the numbing with each new report of infection and death stats. 88,000 infections on college campuses. How can we even begin to grapple with that? We need to grieve. We need to grieve for the lost work, the lost savings, the big dreams put on hold, perhaps indefinitely, the weddings and college graduations that weren't, the proms and b'nai mitzvah, and all the quiet moments in between, the accidental meetings, the human touch, the love that was never given a chance, the children who were not conceived, the music not recorded and the movies that weren't made, meals we never got to have, varsity volleyball games my daughter didn't get to play, the art store on the corner that's now permanently closed. The message from our ancestors is weep, child. Your body needs to crack a little. You can't carry all of this weight, let the tears flow. Today, Let the tears flow. But know that this story does not end in grief. Our ancestors had every right, after all that they suffered, to walk away bitter and defeated, eternal victims of a cruel external reality, forces determined to destroy them. And yet when our rabbis tell the story of the destruction, they do something they did not have to do. They invite a logic of truth-telling, into the landscape of incalculable loss. They ask, why was the temple destroyed? Because of senseless hatred was the second temple destroyed. Our senseless hatred, not the Roman legions, our cowardice, hypocrisy, and callousness, which had become so normative in our own Jewish community that it essentially destroyed us from within. Rather than blame the Romans, Our rabbis hold up a mirror. They venture to try to understand their own complicity. In what ways did we accede to cultural norms that left us susceptible to that Roman invasion? And their gaze is unforgiving. For Rome to conquer Jerusalem, there had to have been real weaknesses in the system, much like there are in America today. Too many people willing to turn a blind eye when neighbors were demoralized and dehumanized. Too many who stayed silent and towed the status quo. Too many willing to hide behind their whiteness and pretend that there are fine people on both sides. Too many who failed to distinguish between the truth and obvious lies. Too many who sold their last principles for a chance to get in bed with power. Too many who contributed to the moral vacuum that could be filled only by extremists. Biryonim, who brought our society to the brink. Our rabbis told the truth. That must have been a really hard call. Our people were hurting. They did not want to hear that their dislocation, their suffering was in part a result of their own failures of leadership, of courage and imagination. I bet people resented the sages for telling this story. I bet they told them not to get political. Some might even have withheld their donations. Your job is to be a pastor, they said, not a prophet. But our rabbis refused to stay silent. We have suffered enough, they said. It's time to be honest. 
because they understood something about healing. You cannot put a Band-Aid on an infected wound and expect it to miraculously heal, not when what you need is aggressive surgery. There comes a time when the only way forward is through the truth, when we are called to speak not only about where it hurts, but to investigate the conditions that allowed for that sickness to spread in the first place, not only to report how many people have been infected by this virus, but also why it took so damn long to get PPE into our hospitals. Why in America wearing a mask, a basic public health necessity, became a culture war, a partisan hill to die on, or more accurately, for others to die on. Why we still don't have affordable, rapid testing everywhere in this country. How did it happen that the wealthiest nation in the world cannot figure out how to cover unemployment benefits for people who are now unable to work? There comes a time when we have to be honest about why this country seems so willing to leave old people, people of color, poor people, imprisoned people, and detainees to essentially die from a lethal virus, and why so many people seem so unbothered by that. We desperately do not want to tell the truth, because the truth will force us to confront the underlying conditions that made America such a rich breeding ground for the catastrophic intersection of crises that we are living through today. Political corruption, an addictive attachment to white supremacy, a spirit of apathy and indifference, a broken economy that rewards again and again profit over human dignity, that feeds us the toxic myth of radical individualism and eviscerates any sense of collective responsibility. Imagine a moral reckoning with the truth. No more equivocating. No more false histories and naked lies. Thousands of cheap, shoddy statues were erected to perpetuate a false moral narrative in this country, but you cannot hide from the truth forever. No more obfuscation and redirection and blurring of moral wrongs. No more engaging the Southern strategy and the suburban strategy as if they're anything more than a thin veil over a white nationalist agenda. I hear our ancestors crying out to us, the most courageous thing to do with your anguished hearts is to finally tell the truth. We grieve and we tell the truth and then we begin to rebuild. I'm sure that those who fled Jerusalem for their lives and watched their whole world burned to the ground, those haunted by the screams of their neighbors and friends who didn't make it out, I'm sure they dreamt of returning home. They missed the sweet bustle of the farmer's market and eating in their favorite restaurants, meetings in their children's schools. They wanted their lives back. But there was no going back because the sorrow and the suffering taught them something. It lifted the veil on what they could not see before with their full inboxes and work deadlines and all that travel. They learned from all the loss and all that truth-telling that the paradise they lived in before was not paradise for everybody. Jerusalem was a beautiful mansion built on a rotten foundation. The sickness of Sinatrinam, senseless hatred, had taken root in the soil. And so their most urgent task was to rebuild, but not to replicate. What kind of world were they to build? One day, Rabbi Yoshua went walking with Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai past the burnt embers of Jerusalem, the world that was, a painful reminder of what they lost. And Rabbi Yoshua wept how he longed to return. How will we connect with God now, now that our sacred home is destroyed, he asked. There's no going back, said his teacher. Now we build something new. But here's a connection that I never made until this year. Remember how the world that died was saturated in sinat chinam, in senseless hatred? Olam chesed yibane, said Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Now we build a world of love, a counter testimony to the world that we just laid to rest. And so, 30 miles or so from a decimated Jerusalem in a small town called Yavne, Judaism was reborn. A society that died on the sword of its own rigidity became known for its adaptability. In place of sacrifices, they developed a world of personal prayer. And in place of callousness, they birthed a world of compassion. In the years after the destruction, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai instituted nine takanot, nine rulings, zecher l'mikdash, 
ostensibly to honor and remember the world that was. But really, it's clear that those rulings planted the seeds for the world that could be. Our new world would reflect the hard-won lessons from the old. Imagine now what tomorrow looks like if, as much as we crave normalcy, we resist rushing back to normal. As much as I want to get my kids back in school and hug my mom and daven and sing and cry in a room with a thousand of you, Imagine if instead we prioritize addressing the pre-existing conditions that made us susceptible to this virus and this violence and these fires that we're living through right now. Imagine if we treated this crisis as an invitation to confront the spiritual sickness of our society. And rather than racing to reclaim some mythic past, we fight with all we've got to build something new. What would we build? a counter-testimony to the iniquities and injustices laid bare in this pandemic. I ask you to imagine a world that centers justice, equity, and human dignity, that's built on the shared assumption that every person is truly created in the image of the Holy One. I'm asking you to envision a society that protects those most vulnerable, that affirms that black lives matter, that engages in truth and reconciliation, that pays reparations, and cultivates a moral imagination big enough to embrace us all. I'm asking us to imagine a world rooted in the realization that we are all part of an invisible web of humanity that crosses land and sea, that gives us both the privilege and the responsibility of caring for one another. Have we not learned that from this tiny invisible virus that hit the world with the blunt force of a thousand asteroids leaving no corner of the earth free of its reach? I'm asking you to imagine a world in which we pay teachers what they deserve and we honor farm and grocery and garbage and postal workers as essential and invaluable because we've learned in this time that we literally cannot function as a society without them. Imagine a world in which community safety is completely reimagined so that it's a priority and a reality, not only in wealthy enclaves, but for everyone, everywhere a world rooted in the shared knowledge that we must live responsibly and sustainably on this planet, lest we bequeath to our children endless fires and heat waves and hurricanes and pandemics. A new world in which we treat our bodies as precious and touch as sacred. A world in which our eyes are trained to see beauty and poetry everywhere. A world of love. Our ancestors grieved. They told the truth about the past and they built a new future, a counter testimony to the world that was. This is our blueprint, an ancient wisdom born of suffering. These Aseret Yemei Tshuva, 10 days of repentance, they come to interrupt our regularly scheduled September every year to call us to the rigorous work of self-accounting. Who am I? Who does the world need me to be? And this year, it's very clear the work that we need to do. First, we need to use this time to grieve, to become the storytellers of our generation. Read, write, weep for all that we've lost. Walk through the Ikar Memorial Garden. Affirm, console, wrestle, remember, cry. And then we need to practice telling the truth. I'm asking you to be more honest this week than you've been trained to be. More honest than is polite. Truth-telling is a muscle. We will only emerge from this train wreck when enough people are willing to tell the truth. And finally, we need to dream audaciously of the next chapter. Stretch your imagination. This moment is an inflection point, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for transformation of our society. What can we, what must we build from out of the ashes. In the days ahead, I will take comfort in the image of a great rabbi wrapped in a coffin, sneaking past the walls of a mighty city that had been weakened by hatred, a teacher at once brokenhearted and already dreaming of a new love-driven reality. We're not there yet. Before we come out of this, there will be more anguish, more loss. We will be pushed to our limits in the months ahead, and how much the more so after the tragic news yesterday of the death 
of our beloved Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Hold on, beloveds, hold on. Listen closely and you will hear the whispers of our past from our shared loss and devastation and dislocation, from our brokenness and our grief, we will be given the opportunity to transform this time of collective heartache into an era of collective rebirth. Our world is dying right now. And after all the destruction, we will build a new world in which each of us will be called to the sacred task of tipping the scales toward love. And that, friends, will be something truly beautiful. I wish you Shana Tova, a year of health and a year of healing.